welcome to San Antonio in our annual meeting. We got up very early <laughs> on a Sunday morning with the, all the festivities going on with the annual meeting and, and fiesta. We really do appreciate you getting up on Sunday. I'm sure some of you had a, a, a very festive Saturday night. So if you have that bad for our new system session, we definitely do appreciate that. Uh, I know we're also live streaming so uh, this session and recording it. So there may be some people who are, are watching still from their beds. So. <laughs> Yes, but yeah, we definitely, so hopefully maybe we'll get a few others. One thing I may ask is, I know there are people at the back of the room, too. We, want to really, we really want to make this seem conver be conversational today. So uh, if you could fill in a little bit, that would that would help us. I know, I know, I know everyone's afraid of the front row, but you know, someone could sit there. <laughs> so what we, what we want to talk a bit about today is our, our conversations around the collection and use of sexual orientation and gender identity data. Um, like many associations and researchers and all, AERA ha looks to really have, give the best information about our members as, as well as we sort of, in a sense, are involved in the thinking about questions that we ask in, in research and data collection methods and categories. So, Every, we really are trying to, to stay abreast of the current trends, and we're often looking at uh, updating things like our, the questions we ask of our members. And one of these issues has been around in recent years, around our, our demographic information. For example, we did, uh, we updated our racial and, and ethnic categories a few years ago, mirroring what the U.S. Census uses. Um, other issues that have come up around the same, uh, time are how do we think about gender, and how are we how are we uh, capturing gender among our members? One of the things, so what AERA's council decided to do back uh, last summer is to use an open-ended question to collect gender information. Basically, uh, gender identification, uh, and then you're, there's a blank space for you to specify. Now, beginning last fall, any new member to AERA, this is the question that they have seen. Um, our existing members, you can go in, you were you're probably, you're probably prompted to update your information. I hope that people have done that, and, and you can not only update things like any other areas that you've studied, or um, looking in, if you're looking at different divisions and SIGs, but also having the option to possibly change or update your gender identification. So, sometimes I think that, I know people are often, when you're renewing your membership, you're doing it so quickly, you may not, uh, people are not always taking the time to do that, but we really are trying to, to reach out to people who are, are paying attention and updating uh, their demographic information, including in the, in their gender identification. So one of the things you might ask is, how do we get here? How do we get to having gender identification having it as an open-ended question. So we, one of the things we did is we, we looked to our, our fellow associations and see what, what, see what they were doing. Uh, APA, the American Psychological Association, and the American Sociological Association, they are also grappling with these, these same issues. And in a, in a lot of ways, so we we're, were seeing very different sets of categories that cross not only gender identity, but also sexual orientation. Um, we convened, convened also an expert panel of education researchers. And, and one thing that's very specific, not only as we are collecting this information about our membership, but also in the sense that as we are setting sort of, you know, what is the general theme or, or standard in research, especially when someone's going into schools, going into K-12 schools collecting data, collecting data in, in co at colleges and universities, you know, so pulling together what education researchers are doing, um, consulting with our experts on our queer studies SIG, as well as our committee on the scholars uh, and advocates on gender equity, our SAGE committee, really pulling together who are the people who are doing this research uh, and what are the categories and what are they finding it that really is the, the best way to capture gender uh, identification. 
but also making sure that we're also reviewing research. Uh, a couple of years ago, we published this edited volume, uh, LGBTQ Issues in, in Education. It really uh, looks at a lot of, of what the research is uh, currently around gender, around sexuality, um, and, and with, with children in schools, colleges and universities, how we're collecting this information. But, but one of the things that we found is that often um, we conflate sexual orientation and gender. If I, if I could do this, title this book over again, I would, I, I don't think I would, would not necessarily do LGBT and Q because really what the volume captures is um, sort of the continuum of sexual orientation from same sex to opposite sex, sort of desires and orientation. There's really, it that we found at this point a couple of years ago, there's not a lot of research about the T, the transgender, but, but often what we're doing is we're putting all these, we're putting all these together. Uh, sort of a misnomer, and one of the recommendations that came from this book is that we, researchers, we really need to dissect uh, sexual orientation and experiences from gender. It's a totally different issue. So, and it's something that's, you know, we really need to think about much more. So one, one of the things though, since this book has been out, and it's that we're finding that there's been a lot more work around uh, new gender questions in research. Uh, uh, GLSEN has uh, the, the, their longstanding uh, survey that where they have uh, surveyed um, young adults in, in um, gay and lesbian communities and really have, have now in the recent years used questions to capture gender identification. Um, also, the federal government is, uh, has been exploring different ways of capturing gender and sexual orientation. This is really very specific because, especially when we look with the federal government, um, because of the, the standard sort of surveys and data collection methods in education, especially from the National Center for Education Statistics, that, that's really what we're doing as education researchers. We, can, we could capture, say, some of the, the leading surveys like uh, the National um, the High School Longitudinal Study or our, our early childhood longitudinal studies, if they, we can get gender or, or sexual orientation identified early uh, when, when kids are in K-12, K-12 from elementary and your, your high, the high school years, this is what rich data we would have, not only on a student's development, but also around their school experiences. Um, some surveys and data collections that are, are out there existing, things like the YRBS, Youth Risk Behavior Survey, in certain communities, where they're asking about students' behavior and health issues, they have already been capturing uh, sexual orientation and now shifting a bit to, to look at, at gender categories. But this is something that's not necessarily universal in all communities that uh, are implementing the YRBS. Similarly, the, the, uh, at the higher education level, the National Survey of Student Engagement, uh, there are colleges can now opt to ask questions about uh, sexual orientation and gender. But again, this is something that is new, developing, and we're finding too that those categories that they are using are not necessarily consistent. So it's not as if it is AERA is using the, the open-ended question. This is something we're still exploring. You know, so you know, in a few years, probably need to go, as we get more of this information, it'd be important to go back to see what, what are the categories? What are people saying? How are they identified? So that leads us to today. Our, in today's conversation where we're going to hear from on the side of, uh, of from research, uh, uh, you know, Jason J. Garvey from University of Vermont uh, to talk, discuss some of his research around these issues. But then also to hear what is it that we're finding from the federal government, well, be followed by uh, Elise Christopher from NCES, uh, Emily Graytech from, oh, is it good? Is it, is it? Uh -oh. it is. <laughs> uh, I'm like, we need we need some humor in the morning too. Yeah, totally. yeah. I, this is one of those things. I'm just like I like I knew something was something was up there. 
from, from Glisten, and uh, also uh, uh, Joseph Sithia from, from NYU, who will also talk about some of the psychometrics uh, around uh, looking at, um, at gender. Uh, and then S.J. Miller uh, will give us some actual, I think we're going to we'll have video uh, and really looking at what, someone who's in the field uh, working with, with students and, and how we can identify issues around, around gender and sexual orientation. Okay. Well, with that, we will turn to our, our first person. You know I didn't study engineering. <laughs> Morning. 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 Hi. My name is Jay. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Vermont, and I study higher education and student affairs. Um, special thanks to George, Nathan, Jasmine, and others at AERA for hosting us. I'm really excited to be here. I proudly identify as a quantitative queer, and so I'm ready to start talking survey design and all things queerness. So today I'll be talking a little bit about the ways in which we operationalize gender identity, sex, and sexual identity in survey designs. Quant scholars who conduct research about queer and trans folk can attest the difficulties in operationalizing these social identities because there are very few parameters for how to do so. Um, consistent with the aims of quantitative criticalism, I argue that the focus on the intent of how gender identity, sex, and sexual identity are operationalized is critical for community-centered and person-centered research. So in my talk, I'll be talking a little bit about the American landscape of higher education quantitative survey instruments in regards to how these demographic informations are collected. To unitize the data across survey instruments, I'm using a catalog of the most widely used higher ed survey instruments. There are 19 instruments that for a span of three years have been used in about one third of all quantitative analyses in tier one journal publications. Um, among these 19 widely used survey instruments, six of them were from the federal government and 13 were administered by education nonprofit organizations. The most widely used US federal survey was the National Education Longitudinal Study and IPEDS. And the most used survey from ed nonprofits was the Wabash National Study of Liberal Arts Education. And as George mentioned, the National Survey of Student Engagement. For the purpose of this paper, I only am talking about 16 instruments because these collect information at the individual level. The other three are institutional level. Um, instruments. I conducted a direct content analysis of the survey instruments and now I'm going to talk a little bit about first how gender identity and sex are operationalized and then how sexual identity is operationalized. All six U.S. federal government surveys and all ten ed nonprofit organization surveys included at least one item or question that measured participants gender or sex. Although whether the instrument focused on gender or sex varied greatly, as did the question and response options, the question item in STEM and response options aligned for 12 of the 16 instruments. That's to say that when asking participants about their gender, the possible responses were gender identity, and when asking to identify sex, the possible responses were sex identities. Among the 16 surveys analyzed, only three instruments measured gender for both the question item stem and response options. Nessie and the faculty survey of student engagement, both administered through Indiana, had the most inclusive gender data collection questions. For both surveys, the question read, what is your gender identity? And the response options included man, woman, another gender identity, please specify, and I prefer not to respond. iPads included an item for gender, with the response options of men and women. 
Seven instruments operationalize sex in both question item and stem and response options. Question stems were posed in three different ways. So some asked, are you blank? Some asked, what is your sex? And then similarly, the college student experiences questionnaire asked participants to identify their sex. Question items for all of these seven instruments had two response options, male and female. With the exception of the Gates Millennium Scholars Tracking and Longitudinal Study, which had three response options, male, female, and refused. Two survey instruments, both administered by the Higher Ed Research Institute, included questions that inquired about both gender and sex. Both the freshman survey and the faculty survey included your sex as an item with male and female as response options. These two surveys also included another optional question that asked, do you identify as transgender? With three response options, no, yes, male to female, and yes, female to male. Finally, four of the 16 survey instruments had stems and response options that did not align. Both the Wabash National Study of Liberal Arts and the Post-Secondary Education Transcript Study included gender as an item stem, yet had response options that represented sex as male and female. The National Study of Living Learning Programs asked participants, what is your gender, yet provided response options for both male, female, and gender, which they labeled as transgendered. Likewise, the Multi-Institutional Study of Leadership asked, what is your gender, with response options male and female and transgender. MSL also included skip logic so that participants who selected transgender received a second item that read, please indicate which of the following best describes you, with four response options, female to male, male to female, rather not say, and intersect, intersect. And I want to note the problematic language in this slide. Regarding sexual identity, three instruments included questions with several response options, including queer. These three were the only response options that included queer for a sexual identity. The Multi-Institutional Study of Leadership included gay, lesbian as the same classification option, whereas the freshman and faculty surveys, as I mentioned, administered by Harry, included gay and lesbian as separate classification options. MSL also included an option for students to indicate that their sexual identity is questioning. Three instruments included questions for sexual identity, but did not include queer as a response option. Both Nessie and Fessy, as higher ed scholars affectionately call them, include separate options for gay and lesbian, and also included an option for students to indicate that they are questioning or unsure of their sexual identity. NSLLP included three options, bisexual, gay or lesbian, and heterosexual. 10 instruments did not include questions or items for sexual identity, including all six of the federal government surveys and four of the 10 education nonprofit organization surveys. This is a quick slide because I don't have much to report, but I just want you to recognize the absence across a majority of the higher ed survey instruments. The most troubling finding from this talk is the seemingly haphazard approach to developing gender identity, sex, and sexual identity demographic items. Across all of these surveys, questions were formatted in a number of different ways that provided unique data and analysis opportunities and a lot of challenges as well. For some of the surveys, colleges and administrators provided gender and sex data for participants and not the participants themselves, including iPads, the post-secondary education transcript study, and Wabash. For example, iPads asked participating institutions to provide percentages of individuals across two categories of men and women. Interestingly, iPads provides information to institutions to determine how to account for, quote, students for which gender is unknown. Their website reads, quote, these individuals are still to be reported to iPads even though their gender is unknown. It is up to the institution to decide how to best handle reporting individuals whose gender is unknown. However, a common method used is to allocate students with gender unknown based on the known proportion of men to women. For all surveys, participants were forced to choose only one response option for their identities, 
and none of the surveys were individuals allowed to provide more than one option. Furthermore, only two survey instruments, Nessie and Fessy, provided additional options for participants to elaborate on their identity with fill-in-the-blank responses. Three surveys each allowed participants to refuse selection of any gender or sex by including, I prefer not to respond, refuse, or rather not say. And similarly, three surveys also provided options for individuals to refuse to say what their sexual identity is as well. The main emphasis that I would like to make is that we need to resist prescribing a template for question item and STEM response options for gender identity, sex, and sexual identity. By proposing a universal model or approach to constructing these questions, we eliminate the necessity of researchers examining their own gender or sexuality narratives, the purpose and design for their research, and the subjective personalities, positionalities of the research participants. Most scholars only consider gender and sexual identity, or most scholars only consider sex, when designing surveys. However, there are a lot of other classifications to consider. If you're doing a broad population study, it may be adequate to only include gender identity, sex, and sexual identity. However, if scholars are doing queer or trans-specific survey instruments, they may consider including other classifications, such as sexual identity, sexual behavior, sexual attraction, gender identity, gender performance, and assigned birth sex. Quant criticalists must focus on the intention of the methods and not exclusively on their output. And there's a few techniques to consider. Um, Open-ended response options, um, including options for refusing to answer is a provocative one because we have to consider how to code and classify those options. So for example, when conducting an analysis with gender as a covariate, should we exclude people who don't conform to man, woman, or male, female if you're analyzing by sex. So you should use missing data techniques to include latent construct variables with missing data, but omitting a person altogether because their gender doesn't fit in the construct is just as problematic as not including the question. Um, finally, I advocate for including terminology that's inclusive across all identities so that we can have a person-centered approach to survey design. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Elise Christopher. You're right by me. Okay. Thanks, George, again. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to be on this panel with all these esteemed colleagues, and I think Jay set it up really well. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you about how we added sexual orientation and gender identity, which uh, we called SOGI, and abbreviate to SOGI, um, items in the high school longitudinal study, which is conducted by NCES. And I just wanted to start off by saying uh, the views expressed here are my own and not necessarily representative of the U.S. Department of Education, the Institute of Education Sciences, or the National Center for Education Statistics. Um, so let me tell you about the study first. So for those of you who weren't aware. Um, so HSLS09, the high school longitudinal study of 2009, is really interested in some uh, key concepts. We collect a lot of data, but some key concepts are, are its core. So we're really interested in student trajectories. So the pathways that students are taking from the beginning of secondary school into post-secondary education and or the workplace and beyond. We're really interested in students' decision-making processes. So how students are making decisions about these post-secondary outcomes, the curriculum they take in high school, and all of their options after they leave high school. So how are they thinking about financial aid? Um, what, where are they applying? Um, what are they thinking about as far as working and being in school? We ask as much as possible the same questions at multiple waves of data collection to see how plans are evolving. And we allow for measures of uncertainty. So we include don't know options because that is a key data point that they don't know. Um, and certainty of, of the answer. This study um, had a STEM focus as well, so we have a lot of questions about the factors that influence STEM um, decisions about course taking and post-secondary options, so post-secondary majors and careers. Um, the basic study design um, I'm going to lay out here for you uh, is nationally representative, and this is the fifth nationally representative 
secondary longitudinal cohort conducted by NCES. So Jay mentioned the National Education Longitudinal Study that started in 1988. This is the 2009 version. <clears throat> um, the data are focused on student level information. So the student is the key unit here. And we collect assessment data, we collect lots of survey data, transcript data, and administrative data. We also have contextual information. So we get questionnaire data from their parents, school counselors, school administrators, and teachers. And in this case, since it's STEM focused, we have math and science teachers. So really a lot of data. Um, we have several waves, starting with the base year in fall of 2009, so when they would have started high school. We went back to them in the spring of 2012. Most of them were in their 11th grade year um, in the first follow-up. Then right after when most of them would have graduated high school, uh, the 2013 update was conducted. So we collected information about their fall plans for 2013. Are you enrolled in school? Are you working? Tell us about your financial aid, that sort of thing. And then the study, the wave that I'll tell you the most about is the second follow-up, which was conducted in 2016. <clears throat> so why would this study add SOGI items? Why were we interested here? So HSLS09 and other of the NCES secondary longitudinal studies are not prevalent studies. We're an education study. We're interested in trajectories, pathways, and student outcomes. That's really our key focus. However, if demographic factors, and, and George alluded to this, if demographic factors are related to the choices that students are making and pathways they're taking, it really behooves us to collect this data. So in this way, SOGI data are similar to other demographics such as socioeconomic status, generational status in the U.S., language spoken at home, disability status, and, and these are things that we've been interested in for decades. Uh, but what are, we, what are we collecting? So uh, Jay mentioned there's just really a lot of information that could be collected. Um, and so we began this process of investigating this in 2013. Um, NCES has lots of different surveys, lots of different sample surveys and universe collections. And HSLS09 was a prime um, starting point for adding these kinds of questions um, because the population would be adult in uh, 2016. Um, so we're not in the K-12 space anymore, and we avoid some of those FERPA complications, and we know that um, these kind of fluid identities are maybe settling down a little bit more at this time. Um, uh, there, were, there was enough time between 2013 and 2016 to get suggestions on items to add, to test those in multiple ways, really do our due diligence and add them to the instrument before the full-scale collection. For those of you familiar with federal surveys, we also had OMB approval to get, um, which is like your IRB, but much tougher and um, much longer. And so um, we wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for that. So we consulted with members of the Genius Group. We had researchers from um, GLSEN and other of these researchers in the LGBT space to look at the most important constructs and the items that had been tested with the young adults. That was really important to us. Um, so what we ended up selecting, given limited space on the questionnaire, um, were the constructs of sexual orientation and gender identity. So we followed examples from the literature and other federal surveys, so such as the National Center for Health Statistics, National Health um, Information Survey, and then for gender identity, we selected a two-question model. The first question being about the sex at birth, and the second question being gender identity. An important consideration is placement in the questionnaire. So um, we ask most of our demographics in the base year or the first follow-up when students had the first opportunity to respond. Um, we didn't want these questions to um, stick out too much or kind of draw too much attention. And so we put them with um, the other family and life events questions near the end of the questionnaire. So um, we do ask a few more demographic things such as di uh, disability status. Have you let your um, pre-secondary institution know about your disability status? And um, do you rent or do you pay mortgage on your home? And this felt like a good place to put these kinds of questions. Um, so the testing progression that we followed. Um, in the interest of time, we conducted a field test and cognitive testing at the same time. So for the field test, we used our nationally representative field test sample, which includes 1,100 students um, that are just a year ahead of our main HSLS09 students. 
and collected data from them in the summer of 2015. At the same time, we cognitively tested um, <clears throat> with a smaller group um, these items and some other items on uh, vocational ed and things that we were particularly interested in testing out um, during the summer of 2015. So um, for the cognitive testing, we requested that the subcontractor specifically recruit at least five <laughs> LGBT identifying individuals so we'd make sure we had a good um, sample. But we also wanted to test these with non-identifying individuals as well, make sure that they are well understood. So um, <clears throat> for the field test results, um, we ended up with over 500 respondents, um, uh, which is pretty good for that short time window that we were working with. Um, for these questions, we had less than five missings. Um, and we don't include a refusal option. So a missing could be seen as a, as a refusal. We had zero breakoffs at this point. Um, so that might indicate that uh, breakoff might indicate that uh, someone uh, didn't like this question. No breakoffs. And um, we did have several individuals that indicated transgender gender identities. So, um, so that was good. So we know that that people saw themselves in the questionnaire and selected those options. Uh, we concluded that there were no apparent issues with these items on the field test. Um, in the cognitive testing, we tested the sex item, sex at birth, and then two versions of a gender identity item that were selected to us by our experts, um, and a sexual orientation item. We ended up with 40 participants and we had a goal of five. We ended up with 12 LGBT identifying individuals, um, four lesbian or gay, five bisexual, three other, including terms that we hadn't yet prepared to encounter, and then zero transgender. Um, and it's important to note, I really want to note here that uh, this is um, something that we should have better caught when we were recruiting. We should have specifically asked, I think George alluded to this, we should have specifically asked for some uh, folks in, um, identifying LGB and some folks identifying T and not collapse them together because uh, for small incidence populations such as uh, transgender or maybe asexual, it might be really hard to get them and the recruiting team is gonna do their best uh, and get the first people in the door. So not their fault. Um, so the results of the cognitive testing were generally, I'm generalizing here over our report, um, the participants liked having more options. So they liked having more things um, from which to select. And um, when they didn't know an unfamiliar term, our 28 to 21 year olds just Googled the terms. That's what they told us. Um, so that was a relief. Um, they did really like the, the simpler question stems. So um, we had the two versions and uh, of the gender identity item and they, they seem to prefer one. So that was really helpful in informing our decision for what to use in the full study. Um, and they said that definitions were helpful. So um, we, because they wanted the simpler question stems, we took the definitions of the terms and put them in the help text. So this appears on the screen as an underlined, you know, hyperlinked thing that they can click and a box opens up that defines the terms for them. They told us they really appreciated the options for something else or a different identity. So some final thoughts that I wanted to leave you with. We did decide to remove the other specified. We included that in the field test. Um, but we, we concluded that we didn't know how to code unexpected results. Um, and we don't necessarily have the resources to code them. Um, this was suggested by our experts that we would get some terms that we weren't familiar with and that would happen continuously. Um, and so to do justice, we wanted to make sure um, that we could code what respondents gave us. Um, I also wanted to point out that when you're recruiting, when you're doing this research, you should make sure to include transgender individuals or um, different gender identities in your cognitive testing and focus groups. Because the criticism is that we may not be inclusive of T if we're only testing on LGB individuals. Um, and that's fair. Um, recruiting may be difficult for some of these small incidence populations, so you should really think about that at the outset of your recruiting. Um, so what's next? So for those of you who are interested in the data, either 
uh, previous users or new users, welcome. Um, the second follow-up um, wrapped up in early 2017, and you can expect these data in early 2018. We will have restricted use, public use, and we'll have these handy uh, quick analysis um, uh, tools on our website, power stats and quick stats. And we're still looking at the data. It's unclear you know, to what granularity we'll be able to get on the restricted use and public use versions, but we will make some of these available to pair with all of the great demographic and student outcome data that we have in the study. And following the successful testing, other NCES studies are considering inclusion of these measures. So currently at OMB, OMB approval is the um, baccalaureate and beyond um, study looking at the labor force outcomes of baccalaureate recipients. So that's exciting. Um, if you have any questions about the study, about any of the secondary longitudinal studies, I work <laughs> on them all, um, please write me uh, or Check out this link that I include here on the page. Um, thank you. Thank you. As we prepare next for Emily's presentation, I want to say something about Glisten and the, the work that they're doing or have done even over the la over a decade in surveying and capturing the experiences of students around sexual orientations, especially gay and lesbian students. It's just been groundbreaking. Uh, one of the things in our edited volume uh, from AERA is that we really drew heavily on some of the, the GLSEN work as well as just its consultation with the, the GLSEN researchers. Uh, it's, it's one of those things, so so hard to capture, uh, to really uh, capture sexual orientation in schools. So, so one of the things that GLSEN did was by going out into communities and, uh, and through community organizations, it's, it's really to, to do that as a sort of a, I want to say, a backdoor way of getting at student school experiences. As we deal with so many things around uh, getting into a school for IRB and things, those things can be so can be so challenging. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's a there's often a gap, you know, in what what students' actual experiences are. So I think it's one thing that Glisten is really trying to find ways to work around that and, and providing great information. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in true nonprofit fashion, I. <laughs> um, sorry. So, um, okay, so I'm Emily Graytack. I'm the director of research at Glisten. Um, and as George alluded to, we are a national uh, education nonprofit organization, and we've been working on, and uh, we focus on working on LGBTQ issues in the K through 12 school space explicitly. Um, and And um, today I'm going to talk about identifying transgender students in secondary education survey research, where we are, where we need to be, and where we're not there yet. And I've been running for the longest because I'm little. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I really want to start by sort of centering our focus on the self-identities of the youth that we're talking about today. So um, oh, all the faded ones who can't see very well, I'm sorry about that. It's my client's mistake, but there's more in there. Um, but these are some of the identities that um, middle and high school LGBTQ students provided and how they described their gender on one of our national surveys in an open-ended um, survey item. So as Elise was talking about, well, okay, we can have an open-ended item, but then what do you do with that, right? How do you code that when you're talking about survey research for policy and practice? Well, you actually probably need to code it to have any meaningful data for policy. So I can't wait to see what ARA does with their open-ended. Um, some, some, of these, uh, some of these identities are probably very familiar to many of us. Some of them may be new to you. Some of them are new to us. This is how we, one of the ways we keep up with the language that's being used by youth is by hearing what they're talking about for themselves. Um, and today, obviously, I am talking specifically around transgender identity. And I want to just own that and say that um, for this talk, what I'm meaning by transgender is uh, anyone whose gender identity is not the same as their assigned sex at birth. And cisgender youth are the opposite of that. Um, not binary of me, but in this case, that it's gender identity um, is the same as their sex at birth. So for many of these youth, many of these youth would identify as transgender. They may use different words to describe themselves. They may use multiple words, but they also may identify as transgender. Um, but some of these youth will not. And so that is an important thing to think about as um, we talk about today and potential limitations. 
So uh, we heard from Jay about sort of where we are around higher ed secondary research um, around uh, transgender and gender identity and um, from Elise is sort of a where we are around with the, some of the post, uh, I'm sorry, for the post-secondary higher ed stuff. So I really wanted, I'm focusing on transgender I identity right now because of what we've heard of how little it is captured. We still need to be capturing more around sexual identity and sexual orientation, absolutely. Um, but as a, as a movement, as a field, as a research, we are far better off um, in terms of how to do that. We might need to push people to do it, but we know how to do that um, effectively and accurately a lot better than we know how to ask about gender identity in any population, but particularly when, I'm ta when we're talking about adolescents, which is what I'm talking about. So to date, there are no federal education surveys um, that address, and I can turn this windy, <laughs> um, that look at secondary, you know, middle and high school students um, that identify transgender students. Uh, there are very few general population education surveys at all that identify this. There's a few general population, some government, some not health population surveys, but most of those do not include items or include very few items about school or education. So why is this? Uh, as uh, Aziz Ansari likes to, would say on Parks and Recreation, um, it's complicated. It's not easy to do this. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Does it mean there aren't people really working hard at places like AERA and um, NCES and other places? But it's not easy. Why? So there's a few things to think about when we think about, and this, many of these are true for any kind of survey um, identity or survey research, right? But thinking about identifying trans youth in general population, high school or middle and high school students, we have to ensure that these items are not stigmatizing or troublesome to trans or other gender minority youth. We don't want them to see an other, right? That does not feel good. Um, or hateful. Um, so we don't want it to be bothersome to them the way we ask the questions. So some folks might not like male to female. That might not feel right for them and it might be like a total turn off, right? So we need to be aware of that and think about that. We also, now, however, while we know we just had those like 35, 50, whatever different transgender identities, for a survey research for general population, we cannot list 50 different gender identities and expect a 15-year-old who has no idea what this is, a straight, heterosexual, cisgender 15-year-old to know how to necessarily answer that. So we need to think about items that are understandable to the general adolescent population as well for these surveys. As Jay alluded, when you're talking about surveys that are specifically around the queer population, you're, it's maybe different, right? Um, you also want to make sure that they're accurately identifying trans youth. We're not getting false negatives. Youth who we are categorizing, however we're defining trans for that study, that it's actually getting those folks. And vice versa, you don't want to misidentify cisgender folks as trans. You don't want them saying they're trans when they're not, because that's going to mess up your data. You're not going to be able to look at disparities or differences, right? Um, and in many cases, and in the particular case I'm going to talk about today, and the research that we did, you want to be able to make sure that they're capable of being incorporated into existing youth surveys. Now, you may not if you're creating a new survey, but for many of us, whether it's working on the high school longitudinal survey or the youth risk behavior survey, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, some cognitive testing we did that end, they have to be incorporated into surveys that already exist. So I'm going to talk about the Youth Health Surveys Project, which is a research project that we did on behalf of All Students Count Coalition, which is um, a coalition with GLSEN and other LGBT advocacy groups, education and youth organizations to help further SOGI data collection in specifically CDC's YRBS. Um, and I'm not going to talk about where they are right now around sexual orientation data, but happy to answer questions. They're like doing awesome around that. It's the most common as folks know. They're now added to the federal and their core survey. But when we're talking about gender um, identity, at the time that we did this study, and still right now, um, there is no way to identify transgender or gender nonconforming youth in the youth risk behavior survey, federal survey. Mm -hmm. Some places are doing it locally. Some states have done it a little bit. Some localities have done it a little bit. But whether they're doing it well is another question. So we wanted to be able to recommend an item or a way to assess uh, trans youth to be able to look at their health and education disparities. And so to do this, we um, conducted some testing of different items. I'm only going to talk about some very, uh, a few items. We tested other items like gender expression and some gender identity things separate from trans status. Happy to talk about those in the Q&A. But right now, I want to talk about um, what we did first is we did cognitive interviews uh, with 14 to 18 year olds to try to understand their comprehension of the items, how hard it was for them, if it was a burden, if it bothered them, what their reaction was, and what their preferences were. Um, it was a small sample for cognitive interviews, 25, 15 cisgender youth, including LGBTQ, but also we wanted to make sure that we had a, a lot, relatively, right, of cisgender heterosexual youth who were not necessarily active allies of the 
average, every day, whatever it is, right? Um, and then we had tra 10 transgender or gender fluid blood tests. So we looked at, um, of course, I just want to talk about sex assigned at birth uh, for a minute. The last two items, so what is your biological sex and the RU items, are items that we often see in new surveys. And I think Jay talked about the RU items. Intersex is not an option that we often see, but we did test for that to understand how you could react. So those last two items, I want to say, um, did not go so well in this pattern of testing. One thing that shocked me is a third of the cisgender youth did not know what um, we meant by biological sex. We were able to find an answer for them. They knew, oh, I'm male, I'm female, but they were like, biological, what, what do you mean? So that was um, surprising in some of the surveys. Um, but nevertheless, um, but both of those last two items, the biological sex and the RU, were, were very troublesome to, to many, no, not all, of the trans and gender queer youth. Um, because, you know, they A, weren't sure whether we were asking, and some would answer about their gender and some would answer about their sex, particularly for that last one. But even for the biological sex item, there we go. Um, I'll give you an example. So this trans girl, she said, um, I'm like hormonally female, emotionally female. People in the world interpret me as female. Like it's kind of the only one that doesn't match technically is my genitalia. So she's a trans girl and she selected male when we asked about assigned sex, but she selected female to biological sex. So this points out the limitations of those sort of items to assess trans. Um, to assess trans people. Now, the assigned sex of birth item with the doctor pulling your birth certificate, that worked very well. We had no problems. Anyone who wasn't sure what we meant by assigned sex of birth is like, oh, well, I'm birth certificate, I'm fine. Some folks want to add, we hear from the community and the folks that we work with in our you know, program and policy work, people want to add intersex to that. And I push back real hard because I say, unfortunately, for teens that are born, that, that are teenagers now, there was no intersex option in the US on the intersex birth certificate. Okay? so. Let's be clear about what we're asking and what we're not. If you want to know if folks are intersex, great. Then let's develop a good way of assessing intersex. And we're trying to do that right now in our current data. Um, <clears throat> so the sex assigned at birth is great for a two-step measure, as Elise talked about. I heard her say it's two minutes. I don't know if there's something else to that. I don't know. But I will go very quickly. Um, uh, this a one-item measure is we did not have the luxury. It's a YRBS of um, birth rights. So, you know, the YRBS, they would only add one item, and they would not change their sex item. They can't. Right? So they can't change their sex item. So we couldn't use a two-step measure. You know, we couldn't use the, the, the one for the two. Um, so we have to look at a one-item measure. So we adapted a measure that had already been in existence and used and tested in Massachusetts. Um, I'm not going to read it. You can read it. But basically, the key thing here is this has some version of a definition, which might not fit our queer scholar definition, but was comfortable enough for the trans and gender queer youth and made sense to the adolescent. Um, and then we also provided different options for gender identity, not just are you trans, but are you trans girl, are you trans boy, are you trans, and identify in some other way, maybe not girl or boy. Um, it tested very well. We got the right answers in cognitive testing. However, um, I want to say something that will come back um, to haunt us in the end, but uh, one cisgender heterosexual um, boy, he said, he clicked on, first he started to click on I'm trans and I identify as a boy or a man. And they said, oh, I wait. At first, I was only looking at the I identify as whatever part. And I clicked on that. But then I saw the first choice. And I was like, I'm not transgender. And then I clicked on that. I misread it. You know, like if I really looked at them for like a second, I would have known what to do. And this is someone who we are paying to be a cognitive interviewer. Who we're you know, who, so he was really taking the time. You think of a youth who's like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, so who's, you know, didn't volunteer and isn't paid to, to think carefully about this. Nevertheless, despite this, hindsight being 2020, we moved forward because everybody was picking the right thing. They felt good. So we went on to pilot test this um, in a nationally representative sample done by a polling firm of over 500 adolescents. Um, it tested very well. Um, sorry, the, the sex of birth tested very well. We tested that too. The trans um, had a little troubles. So we found some over-identification, some potential false positive. Folks whose sex assigned at birth was not the same as their, or was the same as their gender identity and all other indications we had about how they talk and think about their gender, we're checking one of the trans options. Not many, but when you're looking at a very small population, that's concerning, right? Um, so we thought maybe this is due to the, you know, what that, um, what the boy did that I was talking about before. Maybe, oh, I see boy, I see man, I'm checking that, I'm checking that, I'm not reading the question. So we adapted the item and we removed the gender response items and um, we removed the gender response items and we added a not sure option. Um, and we switched a little bit of the wording around, but we were concerned about this for trans, uh, gender queer kids, non-binary kids particularly, and how they would answer this question. 
how would they think that we're thinking about transgender? We did more cognitive interviews around this. We found it actually worked really well for the gender queer kids, the trans kids, everybody. We're like, go ahead, test it again with over a thousand youth. This time, um, we tested it. Still, we had under over identification. So where we are now, Sam, finish sharing. Sam, finish sharing. <laughs> Um, where we are now is we know sex assigned at birth option is good. People are using it. Um, so a two-step method may be most effective for identifying transgender youth. However, we still um, are not good with a one-item status measure. So when we need to think about one item, we need to be doing more research. We can't just throw it out there because it may um, there's promising measures that we don't know how it's going to work. I will say that the YRBS is now piloting a transgender item similar to this and other items um, in some states and localities right now, um, whenever those up to them to the YRBS, so that will hopefully help. However, that item itself wasn't specifically tested and we know what can happen. So we need more testing, meaning we need more funding. We have to assess items in real world settings, pen, pencil, paper, phone administration, school computer, to really understand. And I urge all of us who are really passionate about collecting data um, about trans youth and, and trans and non cisgender identities to um, make sure that we're doing it in ways that help the community and help um, the folks that we're looking to serve and not hurt them. And you, bad data can hurt um, the community. So I ask us all to sort of love your queer survey researchers um, <laughs> and we will help you. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, George. No, 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 no. Being the timekeeper. Mm -hmm. Now, Joseph, something in, we're going to, we'll turn to your presentation. Uh, hi everyone. Thanks, Emily. That was that was kind of like the best setup I could imagine for, for what I was going to talk about. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so um, so um, so Emily mentioned we don't really want to have people identifying as something when they aren't that particular thing, and that's really what I'm going to focus on. I should, probably should skip over the first few slides because I know I'm going to go way over on time uh, and just jump to that, but. Um, so I, I've kind of told this, you know, once we have the data, right? Um, and yeah, well, I'll show you. <laughs> so, um, so, so we have to, once we have the data, then we have to think as researchers, well, who, who's actually considered LGBTQ for the research purposes? It should be thought about through the entire process, but then if you're working with secondary data, then the person working with those data has to think about that and how they're operationalizing things. Um, of course, you could you could break that into who do we consider L or G or B or T or Q, and you you know you can have any sort of permutations that you want. Um, and then a related question is we have to think about how does this affect the outcome estimates? So the outcomes that we're interested in, right? Uh, school engagement uh, might be suicidal ideation, it might be drug use, it, it could be any number of things, right? Um, Well-being estimates. So um, so in a in a paper that's it's conditionally accepted, so hopefully we'll just get over that final hurdle. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of laying out what I, I don't think it's going to be like this definitive thing, but I think it's it's this thing that's kind of saying like let's start thinking about how we as researchers end up categorizing people and start to put together some sort of taxonomy. And I hope it's like an initial starting point. Well, I mean, there's been other things that have happened, but I'm trying to, to say like let's think about this, even though I'm not a psychometrician, but getting in the mindset of, of a type of individual like that. Um, so we might consider somebody. LGBTQ at a particular time point, or maybe we don't, so obviously we know about fluidity. Um, I'm going to talk more about mischievous responders. Um, there's many other ways that somebody might get fall into a particular classification, or they might not, right? Um, anyway, this is, a, this, is, this is a mess, so I'm not going to talk about that, but, but this is kind of the model, and, and it kind of gets to the complexity of the issue. Like, really what we would like to identify is this latent construct of actual sexual orientation. So that's this like little oval there that says actual. But what we do is we discretize these categories and we have to decide on, on thresholds for that. There's all sorts of uh, random error that gets into the, to the model. There's systematic bias that gets into the model and we have to think of different ways of, of how we can address this. Um, all right, so 
and hopefully you'll get over that last hurdle and, and then you'll be able to read it um, if, you, if you want to find out more about that mess that I just put up there. Okay, so now um, let's talk specifically about those mischievous responders. So um, a, a definition, I think a working definition for this is, are the individuals who intentionally provide extreme and untruthful responses on surveys. So Emily mentioned people who, like the, the, the cisgender male who, who was like, oh, I, I, I checked transgender, right? But I, like at first because I was going through things quickly, but then I realized and I read it better, right? Um, that, well, I don't know, we're not, most of this work, because it's working with secondary data, it's not really dealing with trans, right? It's because we don't really collect data on trans, right? So we have data that are more LGBTQ. But, uh, and those definitions I think are more out there in, in uh, the public. But, um, but it's not necessarily a kid who's going through and accidentally randomly checking things. It's a kid who knows what they're checking and is checking a thing because it's funny. Okay, and then the problem is they're not only checking you know, that, that, they're, um, that they're gay because they think it's funny, right? Not necessarily that they have any malice towards the LGBT community, right? Um, they, they're just filling out the survey and they're kind of messing with you as a researcher, right? The problem is it doesn't take that many of these individuals to end up severely biasing your estimates because when you're talking about a population that's 95% of the population and you only have a, even just a small handful of those individuals pretending to be a a member of a population that's 5%, right? Then, then you're gonna end up throwing off the estimates because they end up saying that they, you know, they go with extreme responses for everything. So they're saying that they're using drugs at, at these extremely elevated levels. And then that leads us to reach the conclusion that you know, LGBTQ individuals are, are using drugs at extreme levels. I think I just went through my entire talk right now with that right there, but. <laughs> I'm glad I planned this out so well. But, um, okay, so here's, here's our mischievous responder. And I think I, I probably said most of the things on here, so this will be helpful. So we really kind of want to think about two different things. We want to think about what the truth is and then what he's going to report. And we, he's going to report the things that he thinks are, are funny, right? So um, in this oh, and by the way, this isn't just about LGBTQ individuals. You find these patterns for the kids say that they're adopted when they're not adopted. And we know that they're not adopted because sometimes uh, well, with the adolescent health, ASA, ad health, um, they ask the parents, like, if the kid was adopted. And they're like, no, he's not adopted. <laughs> <laughs> he's ours. He's yes, uh, right. And 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 then what, what you see is the kids who lied about their whether or not they were adopted are two standard deviations higher in terms of um, saying that they skip school. And maybe they do skip school, but the problem is it's getting attributed to the adopted kids, right? So um, and when when that was found out, then it led to a paper retraction and stuff. So so I mean these, which is good that, that we're recognizing things and correcting them, but I think we need to recognize it more because a lot of times we can't, we can't catch these kids. So we need to find a way to catch them and to uh, adjust our estimates. So anyway, so um, this kid's not adopted and he's cisgender and he says he's adopted and he's transgender. Um, and then when we think about outcomes that, that we're looking at, he's not suicidal, but he reports that he's suicidal. So that's going to uh, increase the estimates for both the adopted and trans uh, populations. And he does skip school, and he says he skipped school. Um, well, he was telling the truth there, but, uh, but the problem is it's getting misattributed to other groups. Um, so what I've argued is that uh, these secondary data sets are great, and, and there's a whole bunch of questions that they ask on these secondary data sets that we don't necessarily care about for our specific research purposes, um, and that we don't think differ between certain populations. So, I argue that we should use those other items um, to give us information about identifying who these mischievous responders are. So, for instance, I like we'll just take the the blind and deaf uh, uh, example. I don't really I don't think that that gay kids or trans kids are blind more often than straight kids or or um, or cis kids, right? So if I see that there's a difference, then that's suggesting, well, maybe there's something going on with the data, right? So, so if we can get a number of items that we don't think should be different, or actually maybe they're different, but they're, they should be different in some sort of positive direction, but they're different in a negative direction, and, and so it's a counterintuitive kind of pattern, um, then we can look for people who have, in this case, this kid, um, it's a hypothetical kid, right? But um, we actually do find kids like this in the data set. We, we do have them. Uh, they, uh, you know, he's saying that he has 
two or more children of his own. He's blind, he's deaf, he's in a gang, he's either very tall or very short, and he hasn't seen a doctor in at least five years, right? Um, so I'm gonna show you, this is from uh, an older paper um, when, I, when I hyphenated my last name, too. Yeah, don't change your name if you're in academia. <laughs> 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 don't, don't change it twice, too, in a couple of years. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so, um, so we had, uh, we identified these uh, low frequency response options to particular items and that we didn't think should be related to, um, in this case, to, to gender identity, and then there's also for LGBTQ, um, and they're separate out. So I, I just highlighted this one thing, are you blind or have a vision impairment? The low frequency response option is yes. 3% of the cisgender, and when I say cisgender, it should be in quotes, okay? Like th this is what they're reporting, right? And then trans should also be in quotes. It's what they're reporting. I don't, I don't think that the actual trans kids are the mischievous responders. Sure, there's a subset of them that are, right? Like nobody's perfect, right? But, but, uh, but the, what I'm trying to get at is it's people who are from this outside group that are saying that they are, right? So this should all, probably all be in quotes. But this would lead us to conclude that um, almost a third of trans kids are blind, right? Um, yeah, and over a quarter deaf, and watch out, they're all in gangs and carrying guns around like all the time, right? So, um, so, so these, these things are, are the things that I'm arguing we can use to identify these kids who are giving these unusual patterns of responses and then see how robust our estimates are after we um, remove them. Um, and then I just put up as a, another example of um, the heterosexual LGBTQ uh, differences too. You see that it's bigger for trans um, because it's a smaller population and the kids who are the mischievous responders are, they're kind of going through the entire survey giving these ridiculous responses. And so if you have a smaller population, then they're just gonna have more influence on it, right? So, um, okay, so there's a, a new analysis that I'm super excited about uh, and it's, it's more response, uh, it's, it's more representative and more comprehensive. It's using the, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So these are data that are distributed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, they're publicly available, so you can download these data right now if you want. Um, and um, the, in 2015, there were 19 states and 11 districts in the publicly available uh, data set. And it contained over 146,000 observations. And what we do is we look at 20 different outcomes that are commonly looked at in the uh, LGBTQ Again, this is not T because they don't have the item in there yet. Uh, it's good to know that they're highlighting things. Um, and then I use a, a more advanced method for detecting mischievousness than I did before, and it uses a machine learning algorithm. Okay, so uh, what makes up the screener? In this case, they're, again, things that we expect to be unrelated to LGBTQ status. Um, so they ask about height, they ask about carrot eating, the frequency of carrot eating, of fruit eating, of potato eating, of salad eating, whether you have asthma, whether you don't or whether you don't know if you have asthma. And then uh, they also ask about dentist visits and gun carrying. I, I put those things in, in different things. So uh, it, dentist visits is, is in parentheses uh, because it was actually the most predictive of, of identifying as LGBTQ. And then so we have robustness checks where we're like, well, what if we don't use that item? Does it change our estimates, right? And then gun carrying is in there because I don't really think that, that gay kids are going around carrying guns all the time, right? But some of the literature does say that they do. Of course, that literature is based on these surveys, so it's, it's problematic, right? But when the literature gets out there, it, of course, it's hard to fight against it. So that's, again, a robustness check. What happens? Does that really affect our estimates? And it, it, it doesn't, whether we include it or not. Uh, I mean, you know, everything changes a little bit, but not that much. Nothing to really write home about. It's in an appendix. Um, so um, the CDC recoded biologically implausible values of height to missing in, in their data set. So, which is, um, I mean, if, at first I was like, yeah, all these values of, of height seem fairly reasonable. And then reading through the manual, I was like, oh, this is why they seem reasonable. Because <laughs> you got, because before it was, it was nice with working at, at, with a different data set. You'd see some kids would write in like, I'm a thousand feet tall. And you're like, thank you. Thank you for saying that because it helps me identify you and remove you faster, right? <laughs> so, um, but but they, and then these were all missing, and I was like, oh crap! Like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to find them? Like, these these are nice items, but then, um, so we can actually look at the patterns of missingness, and and that only makes up one of the items uh, in the screener. But 
these are the patterns that we see. At the top, there, it's the top 1% of kids who, we, those are the kids that we predict to be most mischievous based on their unique responding patterns, right? And then at the, at the bottom, it's, I have like the bottom 75% of kids, like they have the, the lowest mischievousness index values, right? But we see the, at the top, um, almost three quarters of the kids who are predicted to be the most mischievous have a missing value for height. Now, yeah, they, they could have skipped that item, but we're, that would be very weird to have it be so highly correlated with identifying as LGBTQ. Like, why are all the LGBTQ kids not providing their height? They probably are providing their height. It's a ridiculous value of height, right? And again, LGBTQ is, is in quotes, I, I would say, because it, there are those who are identifying. So uh, three quarters compared to 3% um, of, of the least mischievous. So that's just one example. That was among males. It's a similar pattern among females, too. I think I could do that. Thanks. Uh, okay, now the results, finally. Um, so these, this is aggregated over the, the 20 different outcomes that we're looking at, and these are average standardized differences. So you can think of them as effect sizes. If you use all of the data, and we separate the analyses out uh, into males and females, and again, that's actually reported males and reported females, because we know from this literature that there's a subset of males who are mischievous responders who also say that they're female, right? And, and they're, they're, they're not trans. They're, they're just kids who are like, ha ha, I think it's funny to say that, you know. Um, so um, so we, would, we would say that, well, the, the, the risk factors and the, disp the disparities uh, would suggest that LGBTQ males are at about 0.4 standard deviations more risk. And then if you, as you remove individuals, um, you see that those estimates change and they go down to about half the magnitude when you remove about 25% of, of the data. That's a lot of, of data to remove, and I'm not necessarily advocating for removing that much, but more for thinking about how much do our estimates change as we do this. We sh they shouldn't change at all, right? But if these kids are in there, they're going to change. Okay, so interestingly, though, there's variation in the effects of mischievous responders across the outcomes. This is very hard to read, and my, um, my standard errors have disappeared. Okay, but I'm going to point some things out to you. So if you look over where the, the purple uh, box is, those are substance use disparities. And what we see is they are uh, highly statistically significant, like p-values of like 0.001, right? Uh, when you use the full data, as you remove the mischievous responders, or the kids that we expect to be, or uh, predict to be mischievous responders, those this, uh, substance use disparities drop, and they drop to statistically uh, non-significant levels. By comparison, if we look over here to the uh, purple box over to the left, um, we see bullied at school, uh, felt sad, hopeless, uh, considered suicide, and planned suicide. And those estimates do not change. So they are robust. So, so this is suggesting that, I, I don't want to say like certain disparities are real and other ones aren't real, but I, I, would, I would feel um, uncomfortable as a researcher presenting the original estimates that you would get with the, uh, if you use all the data for the substance use, when you see how non-robust they are, how sensitive they are to the potential mischievous responders. The bullying uh, ones, though, this suggests, well, gay kids probably are being bullied. And the elevated levels that we see of bullying and of feeling sad and hopeless, they're not driven by mischievous responders because we have done as much as we can do to identify these kids and remove them. And they're not changing. Those estimates are not changing. Um, so I, I'm going to go real quickly because this is kind of cool, though. Uh, so, so we wanted to see what predicts the variation, right? Um, and one possible thing that could predict it is the extent to which an item has um, a low-frequency response because we, we think mischievous responders are drawn to low-frequency response options. So for heroin use, like one of the response options is 40 or more times in my lifetime, right? So um, in very, very few people select that, right? Bullying is much more frequently selected, right? Because it's a much more common phenomenon. So we wanted to see, is there some pattern that explains all this and ties it all together? And what we see is that um, the item response option extremity does predict the reductions that we see in the disparities. So this is all the different items. And uh, basically what you can see is the items that have the largest changes, which means they things go down a lot, right? Um, they're the items that have these very extreme response options, right? So like I use heroin 40 or more times, right? The things like feeling sad are up at the, uh, at the right end. And so um, 
so it, it's kind of it's satisfying because there's this unifying and like, methodologically conceptual way of, of tying this all together. So um, we see this pattern. It's it's it's, it's a strong relationship. It's it's a standardized coefficient of 0.74. So I mean, this is you don't see patterns that strong usually in, in education. Um, and uh, and then again, also for for females, these patterns replicate too. So we saw it in the original study that uses the state and district YRBS, and then we see it again in the uh, nationally representative sample too. Uh, and actually, the patterns are kind of nicer in that because you see this plateauing that occurs. Um, Okay, recap of findings, mischievous responders lead us to inflate estimates of LGBTQ substance use. It's largely because of the extreme response option availability for those particular items. Bullying, victimization, suicide-related outcomes are relatively unaffected by mischievous responders. Those are robust. Um, the bigger problem is it's really among the, re the reported males. The females tend to be less mischievous. In fact, some of the mischievousness is driven by males saying that they're females and messing with with females' uh, responses. The conclusion, I'm going through this really quickly. Thank you, George, for being so patient. Um, uh, the the uh, quantitative LGBTQ research using YRBS data or YRBS-like data uh, is expanding rapidly. It gets a lot of media attention. Uh, it, it can be used to inform policy interventions and public discourse. And so we really need to make sure that, that the findings that we're reporting with that are valid because as Emily said, we. We just it, it can it can hurt the community, right? You can think that well now all these gay kids are they they're at risk for everything. Watch out! We really need, you know, they're so problematized. And and you know if that's true, then yes, we we want to know that and we want to to target interventions that way. But if it's not true, we should know that too as researchers and, and people who are trying to inform the public and public discourse. So um, even published findings. Uh, with very small p-values, they may not be valid, as you can see here. Um, I think researchers should should actively um, try to to combat this and to conduct robustness checks to assess mischievous response parents. And just going back to the very first slide that I had up there, mischievous responders are really only one source of potential bias. Uh, there's a whole bunch of others, um, but I think the mischievous responder bias, uh, from the changes that I see in, in the estimates, it's 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 probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest problems. Um, so that's, that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next presenter, S.J. Miller. And then we'll, then we'll, we'll, then we'll get into conversation as this, as this session focuses on this. Do we have a... of our engineering feats here. So what I want to do is put a face to this. Who are the students that we're talking about? History made at East Mecklenburg High School. New tonight, history made at East Mecklenburg High School. Our cameras were there as a transgender student was named Homecoming King. It's a story that is getting attention across the country tonight. NBC Charlotte's Bora Kim was one of the only reporters there as that student was crowned. at East Beck High School as the Eagles take on the Garinger Wildcats. But on this homecoming night, it would be history in the making they wanted to see. The crowning of 17-year-old senior Blake Brockington as the school's first ever transgender homecoming king. Throughout my life, I haven't really been treated equally as male. And so I always wanted this, always. And everybody's always told me that I couldn't do it. Even my peers, they've always said, you can't do that. You know, you're a girl, even though I've always felt male. And I've always identified as male. Blake is no stranger to adversity. Unable to gain acceptance from his own father, he's now in the care of foster parents like Donald Smith. And he really is hoping that it helps 
those behind him who are going through some of the same challenges and very same struggles. Blake may have been nominated by his peers, but earned this coveted title by raising the most money for the school's chosen charity, all while being an inspiration to many. This is a significant issue for our school because East Mex has been known as a school of diversity and we're always accepting of everyone and this is just another step to show the kind of school that we really are. Even though you go through some things and you have some negative some negative encounters in your life, anything's possible. Like you can do anything you set your heart to. Bora Kent, NBC Charlotte. And Blake Bora tells us plans to attend UNC Charlotte in the fall. When you're trans, it just means that you're your sex that you're assigned at birth doesn't match the gender that you identify with. And so I was born female and I identify as male. Um, some of the struggles that I've had is uh, I've had a hard time coming out to my family, I've had a hard time coming out to my friends and uh, school, but I did it and I've lost a lot of friends. I don't talk to a lot of my family anymore, but I am a trans activist and so I go to Philadelphia and I speak at the Philly Trans Health Conference. Um, I actually had my first workshop this year, first two workshops. Um, I, I would love to, for a lot of the trans youth to understand that they're not alone and that this is a large community. So it's not a matter of being alone, it's a matter of reaching out to who you need to reach out to that will support you and things like that. But definitely there's timeout youth here, um, there's PRISM here, there's um, Spectrum at UNC Charlotte, there's also Transport at UNC Charlotte. I'm pretty sure that every college has a um, has like an LGBT association. So I graduated from East Mecklenburg High School in 2014 and I go to UNC Charlotte majoring in music education and I hope to be a band director and a composer. is the every student who is trying to come to terms with a gender identity that may be perceived in conflict with what has been normalized as the appropriate way to dress, act, behave, and express oneself. Rock is the every student who wakes up Monday through Friday at 6.30 in the morning to come to school, ride the bus, sit in your classes, and roam the hallways. Rock has friends, plays sports, goes to honor society meetings, eats lunch on the same bench every day writes for the school paper, plays in the school band, occasionally ditches school, dates, goes to prom, takes tests, sharpens pencils while everyone is reading silently, and then smirks, laughs at your awful and self-congratulatory jokes, occasionally sh shifts during your amazing lesson, but then a few minutes later, twists a pin around their fingers processing a new idea, Rock cries in your class when they read that the protagonist was killed or an animal was sacrificed to practice dissection for your science class. You say hello and goodbye every day to Brock and even give the occasional fist bump. But Brock has another story that you don't visibly see. Brock is the every student forced to live a double consciousness. They have to fight for the right to use the school bathroom. They don't see themselves reflected in your curriculum. In fact, the only representation they do see is the violence perpetrated against trans people almost daily in the media. And then turns around to see those that the school policy doesn't protect them if they experience violence while on school property. Because of these reasons and too many more to name, Rock is separating, struggling, slipping away into a despair and darkness that most of us can never even imagine and quietly suffers alone. So many of us are not even attuned to recognize that Brock is suffering. If we did, we'd know, we know that we would prepare ourselves to respond differently. So how do we learn to recognize what we don't even know that we should know? You see, Brock is my student, he's your school student, He's your student, your student's student, someone's friend, grandchild, cousin, sibling, someone else's child, your child. 
and all Brocks deserve to be treated with the same dignities as any other student who sits in your classes. But when we don't teach, affirm, or recognize the social, emotional, or academic aspirations of our Brocks, they are erased, disappear, and add to the ever-growing suicide statistics. With an estimated 100 to 150 to 200,000 ish trans youth in schools, and now I know why there is a range. We have a lot of work to do, but we can and will change these stories through the many efforts that you have seen this morning. But rather than ask why this work matters, we need to ask ourselves why doesn't this work matter more? So here's what we know. While gender identity is never identifiably singular or capturable, as it always intersects as intersection with bodies Black and Brown and Asian and Native American and Indigenous and Autistic and Poor and Queer and Transgender and Nonconforming and Disabled, and I can go on and on, bodies can be made disposable when they pose threats to shifting power and benefits away from cisgender cissexual or gender typical bodies. Youth, therefore, whose gender identities are positioned to be at odds with cis bodies and normative behaviors are problematized, pathologized, and legitimated as inferior. And much of that, again, you've heard today through the types of narratives that have been produced. So trans and gender creative, expansive, and dynamic fluid students experience dozens of microaggressions over the course of a school day and leave students with thickening scar tissue. Across a week, a month, or a year, the aggregate of these microaggressions become debilitating and leads to dangerous psychosocial and academic consequences. So the guiding motivators for this work is that these identities are made vulnerable to experiencing the highest and disproportionate rates amongst their peers for bullying and violence, punitive disciplinary action, truancy, dropping out, academic completion, performance, and lower GPAs, mental health and substance abuse issues, pushed into the school to prison pipeline and the foster care system, homelessness, and suicidal ideation. In fact, attempts and completion for trans and gender creative youth continue to surpass any population of teens to date. But even more startling is that trans youth of color, when combined with a queer sexual orientation, experience the highest rates of school violence. So again, I ask, why doesn't this work matter more? More than 50% of trans youth will have at least one suicide attempt by their 20th birthday. Myself included. So as we move forward, remembering our Brocks, we should all be concerned about them. So what are the broader implications of these consequences? So when denied access to certain spaces like bathrooms or locker rooms, schools, selecting chosen gender in a prison, a detention center, a psychiatric or immigration center, or having certain benefits afforded to you, or certain choices like school dress, proms, gay-straight alliances, queer-straight alliances, your, even your mannerisms, your affect, or your jobs, and you're cast out, Dean Spade has told us that the impact of denial can have significant mental and physical consequences. Depression, anxiety, and suicidality are conditions commonly tied to the unmet needs. Knowing that other desired groups have access to these privileges can contribute to a negative sense of self-worth and incapacitation. So some important details that I want to bring you into is my argument in the work that I do is that if we were able to interrupt this much early on in schooling, pre-K on, I would offer that these details that you're about to see would be greatly reduced. And again, as you have seen, many of these statistics could have mischievous identifiers, so how accurate are they in fact? I would argue, though, that the ones I'm going to show you are pretty accurate because the trans community is on top of identifying and supporting and coming together as a coalition to really speak truth back to what's happening within our community. According to the Trans Murdering Project, 
there were 2016 reported killings of trans and gender diverse people in 65 countries between 2008 and 2015. And that was in Central and South America. In the US, according to the National Coalition of Anti-Violence, 81 trans people were killed in 15. And as in years past, a staggering majority, two thirds were trans women. And of those stats, 67% were trans women of color. In 2016, we see 26 recorded deaths, right, recorded deaths. And now in 2017, we have nine reported, five just within the last month or so, two recently in New Orleans, one in Houston, one in Baltimore. And last week, we lost Juicy in Miami. So again, there is urgency to this work. So when we don't stand up against violence and discriminatory practices, not only do we see an increase, not only do we increase the likelihood of continued vulnerability, but our youth will continue to not feel safe. And the every box and the world will continue to face and be forced to encumber and even succumb to such widespread crimes against humanity and possibly become part of these growing statistics. There is a one in 18,000 chance for the average person to be murdered. One in 18,000. For a trans person, it's one in 12. And one in eight for a trans woman of color. One in every four trans people are assaulted and more than one in four in the, for trans women of color. And according to some of these statistics, one trans person dies every year, every hour, excuse me. This is the map of murders in 2015. The advocate put out faces to the people who had died in 2016. So, so what can we do? So we have to figure out how to teach, affirm, and recognize that our trans students, and for that matter, all of the uncapturable identifiers that we talked about today are entitled to the same educational opportunities as their peers and are afforded and we have to work to ensure that equity across, excuse me, that equity manifests across beliefs, policies, and practices. And there is amazing work that's going on in the country. And those are the stories we have to capture because we have to also sh shift and change the narrative. We have to give our youth a positive representation of themselves. So while we do see some changes happening in schools and at the federal level, we have to be mindful that cosmetic changes do little to help establish more fair and equitable schooling environments. If we don't look at root causes and ways to shift the exclusionary political, academic, and affective pra practices and the subsequent conditions that have created injustice in the first place, we are all left with diminished capacities to impact change and will only contribute to the scarring and injuries com combined and by our Brocks. So as you have seen today, to truly liberate how gender identity is positioned in schools, this work does require levels of commitment from various stakeholders and their spheres of influence. So I ask, what can we do collectively? What can we commit to do? And I believe that we can make more than a difference in schools. With found strategies and solutions, we won't just transform the environments of schools. We can create more inclusive and welcoming environments in the spaces beyond and usher in a future that will be better prepared to attend to the needs of our transgender, creative, expansive, dynamic, and fluid youth. This is not cliche. We need to care for our youth. And as you look across these panelists today, you have, as I hope you have seen, that we are deeply committed to transforming our schools and society to, together. So I am confident that by changing ourselves, we can change the world, and together we can and will all make this work matter more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Well, one thing about this session is that it, it was set up to be a conversation, and we really want to hear more from our, our panelists and our, and, our, and our audience here uh, to really get at you know, how are we understanding gender identity? How are we collecting this information? Um, so I'm going to open up first to the audience. Are there questions for the panelists? Am I right? 
Who wants to take that question? I'm looking. Great question. <laughs> University of Illinois has an education system that is the same as the country of Ireland, so we don't have to talk to the Irish in order to understand what they're doing. And I would recommend that any institution that is of some sort of private sector to have a starting point of a couple of things. Issues of equity and education to help promote the dignity and the principles of the country by having a decision maker who can look at that and say, okay, how are we Reaching people who are not of color, who are not white, and so on. So I think that that is a key to understanding the system and how it works. I'm looking for your input on the Ireland versus Ireland question. Um, this is a great question. I've never thought about this, and that's why this is awesome. Um, to add on to the, I, th I could see two potential ap approaches that well, won't work, but um, I mean, I think you could really reflect as an IRB, potentially advocate, like, you know, your role is to ensure that subjects um, aren't harmed, right? So you could say some of your population may be harmed by reading these questions and not having a place to put themselves and to be reflected back this, you know, so you could argue that. I would also say, um, and maybe this isn't the role of the IRB or, you know, Whatever, but why are you collecting this data? Do you need it? And what are you going to do with it? Because sometimes people just put it on and they're not, they don't need it. What, who cares? Mm -hmm. Or at the very least say, okay, if you're going to, I don't necessarily think that binary is always wrong to put. I, I mean, I, if we're trying to understand a real, a reality about a binary society like sex assigned at birth, okay, if you want to ask male or female and you want to know about what sex they're assigned at birth and birth certificate, that's fine. So that's what you ask. Because yes, folks, um, I think some trans folks might not like that there's no gender, there's no trans, but I will say, at least from my experience in talking to the youth, different, not necessarily um, adults, although probably some of them in youth studies, that at least they're like, okay, I, I know how to answer it. And like annoying, but at least it shows some awareness that sex and sex assigned birth may be different. So, but I think the harm route um, could be the way to go for IRB. Another question? If there's a question over here. Yes. What do you want? I mean, the question to, that I would ask is, what do you want to know and why? Like, do you want to know how girls experience school? Okay, then you're asking about gender, whether or not they're trans girls or, or not. Is that maybe that, you know, do you want to know how trans people experience school? You know, so part of it is what you want to know and what you're going to do with that data, as somebody so aptly said here about coding. Um, I, would, I would push back a little bit um, on the idea which, that identifying as trans is something people wouldn't want, um, would see as like a negative or something bad, or that if it's trans, that means you're not female or, you know, and there are multiple 
like you said, folks who don't identify as male or female who may or may not identify as trans as well. Like trans is, I would see it as sort of, it can be a gender identity, but it's also a status or it's also an experience, right? Um, so it, it is complicated, but I think you start with thinking about what you want to know and why um, and let that, that guide you. Question here? So my question is based on the So I can steal the mic. Um, so, uh, so we, so it's important to note we're not asking these questions yet in the um, high school waves of this study. So that's when we would need to oversample if we did. Um, and actually, we oversample based on what we get from the school roster. So it's important to consider. This is maybe down in the weeds for a lot of you, but it's important to consider what would be recorded on the school roster and what they might tell us might be different from what's on the school roster. So that's kind of one problem. So FERPA and kind of um, uh, consent with parent data and that kind of thing uh, is another issue. And we can get into that, um, you know, offline, but um, that might throw a wrench in this. But I think, I think it would be really difficult to think about oversampling if we are not getting the reliable information on the sampling frame. Um, so it's not like we would not be interested in doing it. I think methodologically it would be difficult at this time. Um, so, but that's definitely something we could think about, especially in the surveys that start uh, in adults, kind of looking at uh, serving as the groundwork. Um, the post-secondary surveys, such as um, National Post-Secondary Student Aid Study or NIPSAS, um, that spins off the baccalaureate and beyond or the beginning post-secondary students, that might be a good place to go because those school rosters at the universities might be a little bit better updated, might have more than the binary option to go with and uh, might have that data. So it's a great question and it's definitely something that, that we should think about. I want to add to that too, that we think about uh, if we do have a national policy or sort of like the federal government sets a sort of a standard of uh, type of questions or categories to ask, that, that that's well and good, but at the same time, local politics mm -hmm. plays such a role in terms of what, what kind of questions a, you know, a parent group, for example, allow asked. Mm -hmm. um, if, especially when we start talking about things around sexuality, gender, even pregnancy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, birth control, those kinds of issues. Um, you, know, you know, it's very hard you know, doing research in those like, within it's in a K twelve setting, uh, different communities, different values. So, um, so there's no implications for NCES at this time. I think we're moving forward with the plans that we have currently um, that are go and be and you know kind of chugging along. Um, George, am I allowed? Yeah. Okay. So, so the interagency working group um, has published some papers, and George has some examples here. I'm gonna just you know offer them up to you yeah. um, that talk about the current measures and the agencies that are collecting them. Um, I will know that I will note that that it, that it depends, as as Emily said, it depends on um, what you're trying to do with the data. So what the agencies have expressed is interest in making sure that their populations are being covered. The health surveys have a lot of interest in making sure that health disparities are being covered, um, so that we understand uh, the outcomes there. Um, if HUD is looking at services, and I think they are, I don't want to speak for them too much, but um, if health uh, if, if HUD is looking at the services that they're 
families and households are receiving. Um, and they determine that that's not, that this is not a, an appropriate time for it, then um, that's my, that may be why they would have pulled back that initiative. It's not that they wouldn't consider it again in the future, but their initial investigations that you don't see that may be offline that I kind of described here may have indicated that it's too big of a, an issue at this time. But each agency has to determine what they're going to do with the data, what their needs are. And so some agencies have determined that they, they don't need this data at the time. At this time, their populations can't be measured at this time for, for methodological reasons, wherever they're pulling the data from. And some agencies like, like Ed have decided that, that it is a good time and it's an important time to, to collect this data. So, so that's something that I would encourage you to think about before, you know, um, castigating them too much that, that they do have a reason maybe for, for pulling it back. But I would encourage you to reach out to those agencies at the same time. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Mm-hmm. 
second part of that is understanding my intentions and how I want to express them. So my outcomes may not be what you would expect a person who's reaching for something. So when he's reaching for his kid, he may not be reaching for his son or his daughter or his wife. Um, additionally, I consider myself a servant. So my numbers are my numbers. And so I love putting pictures on Facebook of my kids. Because they're so special to me. And so I find that they express my poetry to me. And so the way the numbers come together for me doesn't make any sense. It's always a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's something. Um, to get into the technical um, part of it, the second half of the project is all about technical stuff. Um, there is so much potential for a lot of different interactions that I could do. understand how um, the social identity um, interacts with gender. To understand, to then help create a um, session um, in the kind of technical scholar way, and also to research gender expression and gender identity and gender politics. Um, um, a lot of quantitative work is necessary to actually be able to speak to all of these questions um, through the intention of what I'm doing. So the communication piece is really I just wanted to add to that too, and I echo appreciation for you are welcome here. Welcome you. Um, and you're very philosophical for a quant researcher. <laughs> I'm like moved. Um, but one thing I want to say is I don't necessarily disagree with most of what you said, but I would also say that there is work for um, inside outside, right? So I personally. Would let, I mean, I want to disrupt the whole education system. I want to disrupt all of that. But, and there are folks who are doing really great work to disrupt the sort of some of the stuff so that we don't need to make the case that this matters. We don't need to show people that there are queer kids in your school. Like, and that we don't need to say, when you allocate dollars at the federal level, you have to allocate for this too because this is how the money is just like. So I want that not to be the case, but as long as that is the case and I support the folks who are working to change that, um, as long as that is the case, I feel like as a scholar activist and applied scholar activist, I will do what I can in the best way to make sure that that we are at the table and to make sure that our voices are at the table. And if quantitative data is what is going to do that, I will do it in the most rigorous, responsible, best way that I can. And I will say that it has made a large impact around policy, it's not the only thing, and practice. Um, so I personally think we need both, and I value both of them, and I... And I um, would say that the quant data has been extremely useful in getting some of the policies to change. And I just want to say, um, as the data collector and data provider, I really appreciate your comment, and I <laughs> accept your challenge. <laughs> High quality data is a is a priority, and so you know I appreciate you expressing that opinion, so that we know you know these are some things that we are still still challenged with, still faced with. So thank you. <laughs> you are the star of the quant session. Who would have thought? Yes. yes. Yeah, um, I mean, and I know you were talking about this, but I just want to throw in one thing that I think is really important to the discussion. So, um, that I don't, I don't think we as LPs or trans people would necessarily say that we want to think about the infrastructure of data and the way the data. Mm -hmm. I see the need for 
So, so I call it apply, yeah. 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 We're almost out of time here. SJ, is there a qualitative uh, response that you wanted to add or anything to this? Anything else? Any other, other panelists? Thank you so much. I'll give you a hand. Yeah.